Welcome to The Edges of Lean. I'm Bella Engelbach, and in this podcast, we explore the human and creative side of lean thinking, unusual places where lean thinking is practiced. We meet people who are practicing continuous improvement in many different flavors and styles. So come along with me on a journey to the edges of lean. Episode 30, Continuous Improvement in the Gulf States, with today's guest, Dr. Deborah Salimi. Dr. Deborah Salimi, PMP, Lean Sensei, is an engineer by training and a renowned lean educator. She's co-founder of the Lean Gulf Institute, based in Sharjah, serving the United Arab Emirates, the Gulf, and beyond. Her clients have included medium and large entities in oil and gas, construction, heavy manufacturing, healthcare, air travel, IT, and more. Her book, Kaizen Demystified, is available on Amazon. Deborah Salimi, welcome to The Edges of Lean. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Deborah, you have a very interesting life story. Uh, and the story about how you ended up working in the Middle East. And I wonder if you could tell us something about that. Okay, well, um, I started out professionally as an engineer. I had um, gone to a special program at Stanford when I was still in high school between junior and senior year. And um, I had an introduction to engineering. And that got me hooked. And from there, I ended up uh, going to Boston University in their engineering program. And um, it wasn't a straight path, but I did get through it and uh, went to work professionally for Honeywell. I was also part of an internship program back in the days when there weren't too many across the U.S. Um, I think the one that I was familiar with model was Northeastern University. They had one of the pioneers in that. And the reason I tell you that is because one of my pet projects when I went to the Middle East was helping to establish an internship program for young men and women. And we'll get to that later. But uh, I had worked in corporate America in engineering, project management type positions, and I became interested in lean, probably about the time that people were getting used to the idea of lean and were starting to realize um, in the technical field, at least, that lean was not a diet program. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, uh, I really got to dig down deep and learn a lot of the on the job aspects of it when I took a position at Mitsubishi Digital Electronics. And this is in the early days of cell phone technology and big screen television. And I had the opportunity to go to Japan and little did I know at the time But when I went to Japan, of course, in those days, there weren't very many women doing those kind of things. Um, The president of US operations had failed to mention that one of the reasons that I was going over there was because I was head of a manufacturing project assembly line and in the US, but they were going to be sending Japanese engineers back when I came back and they would be reporting to me. So it was like, well, I was over there, they were mentoring me, but when I came back to the US, I was mentoring them. Wow. So that led me to lean. That's when I caught the bug. And very frequently people will tell you who are active in lean that lean is not a methodology, it's a lifestyle. And I agree with that 110%. So what does that mean to you that it's a lifestyle? Well, for example, when I'm um, doing sessions or working with people, a lot of times after day one, people will go home and they'll start looking at their kitchen 
and they'll rip their kitchen apart to find this because they realize that there's a lot of things that could be improved. And that's when I know I can kind of tell, or they go in their garage or they go in their workshop. And what that means to me is that lean becomes a way of life. It's about learning to see and changing the way you think and realizing that you don't have to work harder, you have to work smarter, but it's not rocket science. So it can't be applied, it can't be applied to rocket science. Uh, yes, it can be applied to rocket science. Um, in fact, I know someone who works at NASA who became their e-learning um, manager and she went from healthcare to rocket science. Yeah, that's quite a leap. So you, yes. in your life, in your life, you, you, you grew up in California, am I right about that? Yes. And so then you were clear across the country to Boston for, for a university and then mm -hmm. presumably moved for your career and you ended up in Japan um, working for Mitsubishi in this really, I think, it sounds like a very challenging role of needing to be able to um, earn the respect of Japanese engineers I'm who I assume were probably all men. Were they all men or mostly men? Um, the plant that I was in, there was one female engineer. Wow. And um, a lot of her work was involved with blueprints and not hardcore engineering work as I saw it. But that has changed a lot. Which is great. Yes. So, so... You must have, as you were learning, as you were in Japan, or even as you met, made the move from the West Coast to the East Coast and, and then into a company and, and then in the company to an international assignment, you must have started to learn a lot about culture and, and the impact of culture on how people um, work with each other. What were some of the things that you learned in those changes? Well, actually, one of my... Um original thoughts when I was trying, you know, you ask, the, people ask you the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. Um, I said, I wanted to be an anthropologist. And what I ended up doing was learn by doing aspect of it, by being exposed to all of these different cultures and places. And I just want to clarify, um, when I was working for Mitsubishi, I was based in the U.S. in California. Mm but I did have a short stint in Japan. And it was a short stint mainly because of, of my personal family situation. I wasn't able to take everybody over there. So they gave me a short stint and then we came back. But you had that experience of, of even if it was for a short while, working in another culture, in another, in another country culture. Um, and one of the things that I've observed is that even inside a company that there are different country cultures inside uh, inside the company. So you could still probably imagine sort of have that, yes, we're all Mitsubishi, but how we think about that might be quite different. Uh, well, it was very interesting because um, when I was there, it was in the early 90s. And so it was, there's an old movie called Gung Ho, and it's about a um, American manufacturing automotive company that gets taken over by the Japanese. And it talks about how the American workers integrate and with the Japanese workers who come over to teach them the system. Mm. And so for, you know, diehard lean people from eons ago, that's an entertaining movie to watch. <laughs> well, so what's more entertaining when you live it. <laughs> when you live it right so what uh, so was your life like the movie or very different from the movie um i would say in some aspects because i worked for a japanese company in the u.s there was a lot of interface with japan and of course most of the um, employees in southern california were not japanese other than the ones who came from japan Mm -hmm. And everybody else was multicultural. So in fact, one time there was an experience where 
um, we had a sister factory south of the border in Mexico. And this was the time periods of maquiladoras and all of that. And there were some um, issues and there were trouble with communications between the California and the Mexico plant as far as people not understanding. So this was a different approach that I had not seen in the corporate America environments that I had been previously in, where basically um, we took all of the assembly line workers and a few engineers and others, we put them on basically tour buses. And since to the border, you could get there and go to the Mexican factory and come back within uh, the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we did. We put all the Americans, because it was easier to get Americans to Mexico than Mexicans yeah. to Americans. We put everybody on a bus and we had them partner up with their counterpart in the Mexican factory to get to know each other as, pers as people, um, to give them the opportunity to have lunch together, and also to exchange their thoughts about how to make things better in their particular area. So and not just mutually beneficial. And so not just talking about going and seeing, but really putting, literally putting people on the bus and going to yes. see, even if it was only for a day. Yeah, and I think that is very different from, from culture in many American uh, companies. And it's one of the things that, that I'm a little bit concerned that we're losing again with COVID and working remotely um, is, that, is that ability to you know, get on a, a bus or a plane or you know, even walk down a hall and, and really go and see what's actually happening inside an organization. You know, there's a lot we gain from being able to work remotely. But um, that there's nothing like having lunch with somebody, is there? Well, having lunch with somebody inside a factory, if that's where you work, that's the best place. And, um, you know, they did run the assembly line for part of the day, but they had twice as many people in the factory, <laughs> one in observer mode and the other in doing mode. Wow. Wow. So that was that was part, an important learning, I would I would imagine for you to to participate in that and to be to be part of how that how that came to fruition well it was very exciting um you know there's some moments that you remember throughout your career that made a big impression mm -hmm. and that was one of them and that leads me into i won't say moment but years where as you and i have talked before i have spent time with my family in the middle east um we originally went there because my husband had, a, we left Intel Corporation to go over to the Middle East. Uh, my husband had a dream of building a factory based on lean principles from scratch. And the opportunity presented itself. And so he was over there. And after a year, uh, myself and our daughters joined him over there. And while I was there, or actually right before I was going, um, the opportunity presented itself. I was asked, um, well, would you ever consider taking a teaching position? And I had worked um, with Intel University as a trainer as part of my regular duties when I was in charge of the um, master schedule for the first Pentium factory in the US. And, you know, that's one thing that I'd also like to stress that this lifelong learning, because when people talk to me, especially uh, when you're in foreign countries, many of the people that I've met, not so much now, but earlier, they basically have the same position or this work in the same field for most of their professional lives. And as you know, that's not the way things are anymore. And so, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked in oil and gas, I've worked in um, platform, oil platform, et cetera, construction, which is petroleum construction. Um, at Intel, you know, there was the building of the Pentium factories, which was clean room type environment. Uh, I mentioned that I've worked in uh, cable TV, 
as well as television manufacturing, big screen back in the days when there was these big three CRTs, you know, with the three colors. And in the design stages, yeah, I got exposed to the technology of the future where you have this television that's about that thick and it mounted on the wall and you don't see the wires. But back then that was in a think tank. And so it's been very interesting. And I don't think that I would want to do it much differently. Have that variety of experiences and, and to go different places and work in different different types of uh, companies then is, has, been, has been a driver of learning for you. Definitely. Um, I couldn't imagine myself doing the same job day in, day out for 30 years. Not even five. Not but even, not even five. <laughs> That's just me. I mean, I have worked in organizations twice where I stayed nine years each time. One was healthcare. Mm -hmm. And um, my role in that originally was to begin to introduce lean into a healthcare environment. And I ended up being manager of the learning center, which was corporate learning for 9,000 employees. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious. And I like to encourage others to be curious and don't hesitate, don't hold back. That's such great advice. And, and I think, you know, I think for young people today, th th there is not necessarily that expectation that you, that you start out, that you stay where you start out, right? But, right. but really that diversity of experience in doing that you start to think, I, you start to see, I think, the themes and the things that are important in every industry and in every place of working. Uh, and um, so I'm curious, Deborah, then as you move to the Middle East, what did you see that was similar to what you had seen in working um, with the US and Japan? And what was, what, what was strikingly different to you? What was similar? Well, for starters, I would say that um, because I mentioned that I started working in a university, mm -hmm. well, this university was basically part of University City. And um, it was founded by the Sheikh of Sharjah. And what he went off and he had a dream that he wanted to make an education center so that many of the young people would not feel the need to go to a foreign country, but he wanted it to be of a standard on par with Europe and the US. So his vision was to establish a university, the American University of Sharjah, as well as University of Sharjah. And then there were many other things like the police academy became part of this university city, as did um, the higher colleges of technology, then there was arts and science. And then later on, you know, this is now like over 20 years later, uh -huh. there is um, a medical school, there's a dental school. So it's just, you know, it's a lot of the dreams that people have when they're coming to the US, you know, improve, make things better, uh -huh. find a better life, all of this. But what I see over there is that it's almost like it's on steroids because the momentum and the volume of changes that have occurred, even what I saw 20 years ago and today are just phenomenal. And the ability of people to adjust. And let me give you one example. Um, in the UAE, there's a lot of initiatives to advance women. And most people are not aware that in their university, more than 70% of university graduates are female. In the Emirates. In the Emirates. Yeah. And, and wow. that's where we're based. Um, also, two thirds of all positions held in the public sector, those jobs are held by women. And 20, 30 years ago, the numbers were not there. And so when I'm talking to, you know, different people and 
whether it's in the UAE or it's in the States or it's in Europe or it's in South America, people are curious, but many are not aware of the advancement. And I know that um, the UAE also um, had their first women judge sworn in in 2008. And their whole, at this point, their whole parliamentary system um, has, they have targets as to how much, how many women should be involved in the government, et cetera. Which is, which is very different from the US. A very different model. Yes, yeah. yeah, very different, very different. I think it also brings up, Deborah, um, you know, the diversity of the Middle East and, and actually one of the things we haven't talked about, which is, you know, when we talk about the Middle East, what are we even talking about? Um, you know, for those of us in the U.S., I think we usually hear about the, the Middle East in terms of, you know, of some type of conflict, which is unfortunate because um, that we don't hear the, you know, the stories, these stories about, about this type of advancement and the growth and um, the industry that's going on. So, so, um, and, and you really, you really are, are based in, in the, U, the UAE. What do you, what do you see in terms of that diversity? Well, I speak about UAE because that's where I've spent the most yeah. time. And that's where we're based. Um, for example, we're part of the Lean Global Network, our institute, the Lean Gulf Institute. And basically there are 30 plus institutes across the globe. Mm -hmm. And when I am talking about what we do in our region of the world, there are 180 different nationalities representative in UAE alone. And it's a relatively small country. There's less than 10 million people. And 80% of that are expats. In other words, they were not born, raised, they're not UAE citizens. So most people came from somewhere else. And, and people are taking, bringing their families there, presumably as well as you did, and, and children are growing up with that multicultural experience. Yes, very much so. And even if they're from regions of the world that you know, maybe there's two cultures that are in conflict or two countries that politically don't agree on each mm -hmm. other. When they're in UAE, you still end up seeing some interaction, whether it's at work, at the grocery store, in the different active social activities that are in the region. So that creates a lot of opportunity then for learning from each other and, uh, and for growth and for innovation, I imagine. Well, personally, I look at it as that that shows that if you look, you can find some commonalities yeah. to build upon. And that, you know, you don't have to look at it just from the political aspect. You need to be, like, as you say, lean, lean is for humans. Mm -hmm. I do and agree with that, yes. Developing, <laughs> this is developing that humanity real time at the gimba you know the place where we do the work where are you seeing lean being uh deployed or, or brought into organizations what type of organizations presumably you you've been uh doing that in the university where else where's your husband been been working as well well i started in the university basically yeah. i had four years in the university i got to see the first graduating class um now most of those um People are in various positions all over the country. You have organizations, and I'm just talking about the ones that we've personally worked with, uh -huh. although I do know of others. Um, I am aware that it's done in the banking industry. It's um, been done, as I mentioned, oil and gas. Um, it's gotten to the point where it's in government as well as healthcare. Now, wow. you know, traditionally, um, for those of us who've been around for a while, we know that uh, government and healthcare are usually about 10 years behind the rest of the industries, if you look at them as an industry. 
Behind manufacturing, but, yeah. 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 Because most assume, well, lean is manufacturing, which uh-huh. we know that's like only about that much. <laughs> and so, as I mentioned, um, in manufacturing, of course, there's steel factories that I know of, there's cable companies, um, there's food, fast food, there's um, bakeries, there's just all different types of places because there's so much going on in the region and uh, you know a lot of development and a lot of growth and very young populations. And that's, you know, most of the Gulf as well as beyond that. So, so very, very broad um, acceptance. How, how is it um, taken up by management? Is it, is it seen as something that managers should be learning and managers should be managing and coaching in a lean way? Well, lean prevents a, presents a very strong cultural change. Yes. Because many organizations, and you know, the same isn't true in the US and Europe and other countries, if we're really honest with ourselves, a lot of it is very top down and collaborativeness and getting out of the silo presents challenge. Well, it's the same, I, my experience is globally. It's not just one country, but that's an area that needs um, the way that we look at it with the Lean Gulf Institute, which has been in existence for about 11 years now, is a lot of it was first creating awareness, Mm -hmm. you know, answering what is lean, what isn't lean, why should you be interested in lean, what are the benefits, and how does it impact you personally when you become lean? And so taking that to another level, uh, in some arenas, we've been able to move rather quickly. And in others, it has been very slow. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that arena. Well, there's a lot of work to do all over the world, I think. But yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but gosh, in, in 11 years of the, of the Lean Gulf Institute, uh, it sounds like there's been a huge amount of progress, um, but I, I think it's fascinating what you say about in, what is probably an inherent management culture that you see almost worldwide, um, you know, of being top down, of being very high, hierarchical. And um, do you think that's it's it's worse? I wouldn't say worse, but is it is it a stronger culture? Um, in a place that has been um, historically uh, more male dominated? Um, Well, I don't think it's a female versus male issue. Um, Mm -hmm. Universal, it's it's been a management style, it's leadership. And uh, as you know, that usually you can get most of the workforce on board you can get higher management on border, but those people, the sandwich it's, in the middle, are the ones that struggle with it because mm-hmm. their role is the one, their role changes the most dramatically and the most drastically. Um, those in middle management have to learn a whole new way of conducting themselves. You know, that you rest or you leave the problems to be addressed by the people who are there who have the best knowledge, which is most of the time, a lot of the time, the frontline employees. And that if you're in management, you have to bite your tongue and not come up with solutions, but coach your employees to come up with their own solutions, which most of the time turn out to be much better than a member of management because they have that hands-on day in out experience of dealing with the situations. And that is universally true. I think Deborah, you know, it doesn't matter what country you're in. It's it, the, the plight of the middle manager that, and that feeling of you need to deliver for the, for the people who are above you, who are making requests and demands of you and setting objectives and, and, uh, 
you've got to somehow, you know, get the people who are doing the work to get it done on time. It's a very difficult place to be. And it's very, it is hard for people who, especially those who were promoted because they were good technically. Um, and that they have to, as you said, whether or not they're doing lean, they have to learn a new way of working. But, but lean is, is a very different way of working, especially the coaching piece. What is the best? Uh, yes, very much so. In fact, one organization that I'm currently working with, they're talking about um, compassionate leadership. And so, you know, a lot of this, when I first heard the word, I was like, whoa, okay. That's a totally head on approach to uh -huh. take, you know, addressing this. And I thought, that's great, more power to them. <laughs> Let's see where this journey goes. Yeah, and that's a, I think that's a direction that, that we're seeing here in the US as well, that there is an, an interest in how can you, in a way, so be a better human being as you're becoming a better manager. And, and if you do that, does that help the organization? But it's still culturally very difficult to do. Definitely, um, because I think you need to first be a good human being in order to become a better manager, but that's me. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think you can practice your way into doing that? I mean, you can you can behave your way into that into that belief. Well, I'm willing to give it a try. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. What are you seeing for the future um, in the UAE and with the Lean Golf Institute? Well, you know, like everyone else, there was a lot of challenges with COVID. Mm -hmm. And we're still rising to the occasions. And I think that in some ways that it gave people an opportunity to sit and reflect and to see, okay, you know, where do I want to go from here? And how do I, what do I want the future to look like? And that is, you know, not just on the job, it's at a personal level. Yes. And I think that was long overdue. Um, not happy that we had to go through this situation to be able to come to that realization, but I'm thankful that the opportunity is presenting itself. And so has there been a pause, do you think, in the UAE in terms of lean deployment? I mean, you're back in the U.S., but... Um, I don't think it is so much a pause, but I think it's, there is a lag because now there's a reshuffling of priorities. Mm. And, and so, you know, a lot, in a lot of instances, the priority has been to maintain the bottom line. And so progress on things that are maybe new or innovative are moving at a little bit slower pace. But I don't think that they are, you know, I don't see lean disappearing. It was very interesting. The there. It's, it's there. It's, it's embedded, right? Yeah. So people, mm -hmm. people are thinking that way. It was very interesting to me, uh, just observing the, in the U.S. that when the pandemic started and a lot of companies were furloughing uh, people, they were furloughing, in many cases, the lean folks, the people who were, you know, helping to do continuous improvement in organizations. And now I'm seeing it again, this is just an observation. It is not any way backed up by, by data. I am seeing a huge rehiring of uh, people who are uh, practicing lean able to do continuous improvement. And I believe new positions being created. I've never seen so many um, lean and continuous improvement, you know, six Sigma jobs posted as I have as I'm seeing now. And um, I, I wonder if you guess, we'll see the same thing worldwide that, that as companies struggle to recoup and, and figure out how to do things in a different way, perhaps with a smaller workforce um, because of people's um, you know, changing desires about how they work, um, that they are going to need more people who can help them think through, how do I work this way? How would I work differently in a lean way? Well, I, I agree with you, but I think there's one thing that we have to emphasize, and that is that lean is not about cutting people. Right, right. It's not about getting rid of people at all. It's the inverse of that. 
It's more about learning how to recognize people's inherent talent and skill and um, making sure that you have the right person in the right position so that they can build upon their strengths and also improve in the areas in which they are weak because they'd be able to partner with someone else who has that as a strength. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply that, that companies were letting people go. What I'm, I'm really talking about is that, that many companies are struggling to hire at the moment. Um, right, no, yeah, I understood right, that, yeah. but many times, you know, a, because I operate in a different region of the world, some people think that me, lean means cutting the fat, which means you get rid of people. And no, that's not lean. <laughs> right. And that, and that is certainly also when we talk about commonalities across the world, that's one of the first things that people think. And, and I just read, I know, a very, very sad uh, story from somebody who is in a company that is really, really struggling with their, um, with their workforce, not having enough people uh, and really struggling with their supply chain and ascribing a lot of it to uh, lean manufacturing. And, um, you know, that lean manufacturing meant that, that the workforce was already cut to the bone before people, um, you know, left or were, were furloughed. And uh, I think it's, um, you know, it, that's a very common mis misapprehension about lean. Very much and, so. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's part of the old school thought process. And yeah. as people get more exposed to lean and they start to implement it and be, it becomes a part of them and they see that, yes, there are ways that you can do things more simply and takes less time. And that frees you up to do other things and explore other avenues. Right. So that's the way I view it. Right, right. Like create new business, um, create new products. Um, provide a level of service that you couldn't provide before. Those are all things that, that you can do once you start to create that space in your organization. Definitely. And I know from personal experience that if I didn't have the opportunity to hone my lean skills in the workforce environment, that it would not be possible to go off and work on a not-for-profit model in a region of the world, which is not your home country from birth, to be able to take it to that next step and to be able to have an impact. And for us at the Lean Golf Institute, that's what it's all about. It's about having impact and spreading lean. So you, I, I wonder if you would take a few minutes as we wrap up, Deborah, to give some advice to young people. You've had such an amazing career in so many places, um, so many different types of organizations, and and um, really, I think an, an incredible family story as well, which we haven't even touched on. What would be your advice to a young person starting out in their career? Don't discount your education. Yeah. In other words, you know, very often when you're in university, you think, oh, I can't wait to finish my bachelor's or I can't wait to finish my master's. I'm done with school. Well, the reality is, is um, you're going, if you want to be successful, you have to become a lifelong learner. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, pursue an education and get your PhD. No, just be observant, learn to see so that you can explore these things. And for me personally, when I graduated with my bachelor's, I had no idea of all the different types of industries that I would work in and all of the different types of people and environments that I would be in. And there's things that you're just gonna learn by doing, which is one of the main features of developing your lean skills. You know, lean is like learning to ride a bicycle mm -hmm. or playing a musical instrument. Reading all the books in the world isn't good enough. So I won't say don't waste your time, but there's more effective ways to use your time if you want to become lean. So don't discount your education. 
don't discount your education, but don't be afraid to broaden your horizons and look for things in an unexpected place because opportunities do present themselves. What excellent advice. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah Salimi, thank you so much for traveling with me to the edges of lean. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. This is Bella Engelbach, and I'd like to thank Dr. Deborah Salimi for being my guest on the edges of lean. What did you learn from Deborah, and where are you taking continuous improvement? We'd love to hear from you. Comments, feedback, and ratings are welcome and greatly appreciated wherever you watch or listen. Or reach out to either one of us on LinkedIn. Please join me for more of The Edges of Lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find helpful and educational new podcasts and video content there every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelberg. This is a Lean for Humans production.